Good morning, everybody. You know, I'm just standing here wondering which prophecy it was. <laughs> prophecy is a, is a, is a multi-edged weapon. It can do great good, it can do great harm, depending on where it comes from. If it comes from the flesh, it's probably fairly harmless. If it comes from the other side, it can be terrible. I never realized the Lord called me out of my office in 1975. And uh, I knew he'd been calling me for about eight years. And in 1970, I nearly wound up in the terrible situation of becoming an Anglican minister. <laughs> but I hope it hasn't offended anybody here. But the Lord stopped me through a little book by a man called Michael Green, of all people. And Michael was encu encouraging me to go to St. John's Nottingham, where he was principal at the time. And I had to tell him it was his own book who put me off. <laughs> As Michael said, there are many ways of being called to serve. And, um, and the Holy Spirit said, and this isn't one of them. <laughs> all the lights were green, all the voices were encouraging, all the doors were open. And I had to go to the selection conference and say, it's lovely to be here, but I know the Lord's told me not to go forward. Which, uh, which I went back to my lawyer's office and another five years or so I was perplexed until the Lord called me out of my office. And that, that evening I sat down to read my daily portion. It was Jeremiah chapter 1. And it spoke to me like nothing had spoken to me before. And if I'd known what was good for me, I'd have taken the first train somewhere else. Um, because I had absolutely no idea what the significance was. But a, a brother said to me not long ago, he said, David, I can't see why uh, the ministry of the prophetic should stir up Satan against you in any way at all. I just can't see it. And he said, so show me scripture, show me scripture. And I said, have you ever read about Elijah and Jezebel? And you'll find Jezebel in every church where the Holy Spirit is active. In fact, Jezebel is the most, one of the most powerful spirits controlling the church today. And it's everywhere, and it's subtle, and it's in men. It's, it's, not, it's, not, a, it's not a female spirit. It often shows in particular ways in, in women, but it shows itself in men. You get your controlling, overbearing pastor. He's probably got a Jezebel spirit. He wants to rule the roost. Anyway. Jezebel is alive and active, along with everything else. But, but prophecy can have some fun as well. I was thinking when our brother was talking, all, all sorts of things crossed my mind, uh, and when Ian was talking last night. And uh, I think of JWs. I probably shouldn't tell this story, really. But I have a very good friend. Some of you will know him, of course. Um, but I'm not going to tell you his name in case you don't. Uh, he lived for 28 years in Australia. And uh, his, his mother uh, came to visit him on one occasion, and he had been visited by the JWs on a number of occasions, and he just couldn't cope with them. He couldn't manage to get rid of them. And his, his mother was, um, well, let's put it this way, when, he, when this uh, friend grew up, he grew up in a house where he said there were really two brigadiers, a male one and a female one, and the female one was stronger. His father was a brigadier, full brigadier in the army, and his mother had been a captain in the ATS, which is as high as you could get, uh, and she really ruled the roost. And I, 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 had, I never had the blessing of meeting her. I wish I, wish I wish I had, because she was obviously a tremendous character. And she would dress up in her tweeds and pearls for Sunday church, and she was all ready for Sunday church, uh, where when she and my friend... Um, were about to go, and my friend looked out of the window and saw a couple of JWs walking across the lawn. And he groaned and sort of hid behind the curtain. And she said, what's the matter, dear? I, I said, it's, it's, it's the JWs. Oh, would you like me to talk to them? So, so pearls, and, pearls and tweeds and stuff, she went out and walked across the lawn and encountered these two astonished, astonished gentlemen. And she said, good morning. I said, good morning. Excuse me, forgive me asking, are you, are you some of those religious cranks? <laughs> <laughs> and they said, well, well, we're Jay, well, 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 she said, oh, I thought so. And she said, well, why don't you just, and I'll leave you to fill in the rest, because she used army language occasionally. <laughs> and they turned and fled and they never came back. 
<laughs> it's a wonderful story, really. I'd have loved to know this lady. She, was, she only died a year or two before I could have known her. And when we were talking about um, prophecy, we were talking about the man who... Uh, prediction is, is very, very dangerous. Personal prophecy is the most dangerous of all. I had a good friend called Peter, Peter Fenwick, who was pastor of the Sheffield Fellowship. And uh, a man in his fellowship absolutely wrecked his life, his faith, his career, and everything on the basis of a word of prophecy which was given by a well-known charismatic leader who's still around. And years later, the, um, uh, Peter met this, this chap at a charismatic conference and said, I, said um, so and so, I've got a little story to tell you, and told him about this, this man and the wreckage that made of his life and the prophecy that he was given. And this man said, oh, yeah, sounds like one of mine. <laughs> and, and Peter said, it was, it was. He said, oh, they go that way occasionally. We have a terrible responsibility. We have a fearful, fearsome responsibility. Mm. On the other hand, you can get some good fun out of it. I had a good friend called Johannes Fasius, who's been with the Lord for some years. Many of you will have known Johannes. And Johannes was very much around in the early stages of the charismatic renewal movement. In fact, in Copenhagen, he used to say that they left their footmarks all over the ceiling when they had a celebration. And he said he'd been in some wonderful situations of prophecy. He said he heard one which didn't sound too bad until the guy said, oh, and by the way, said the Lord, a happy Christmas. <laughs> and, and was, and the, the one that was even better, I thought, was um, when the chap said, oh, uh, you know, they often prophesied in what they thought was King James stuff. Thus saith the Lord, oh, saith the Lord, oh, oh, as Aaron led the Israelites out of Egypt. There's a stunned silence. <laughs> Correction, says the Lord. I suppose it's... <laughs> There's some entertaining things happened during that time. However, <laughs> I'm afraid my family would tell you that my sense of humor is... Uh, is um, I can't get rid of it. There's trouble. <laughs> <laughs> um, I sympathize with Brother John in that way. And anyway, I, I, want, I had all sorts of things I wanted to talk about. And Clifford always says when I talk, people need to get the calendar out instead of their watch, which is a bit of a nuisance, really. Um, but as I only have a limited time, I must, I must limit myself. I want to start by emphasizing to you that you're citizens of another kingdom. It's very important in these days that you know that you're citizens of another kingdom. And I'd like to underline it, if I may, by going to Hebrews 11, which is such a familiar passage. But we are in the same sort of situation, spiritually, as Abraham and Isaac and company. And I want to read you a little bit from Hebrews 11. By faith... Verse 8, this is, Hebrews 11 and verse 8. By faith, Abraham, when called to go to a place he would later receive as his inheritance, obeyed and went, even though he did not know where he was going. By faith, he made his home in the promised land like a stranger in a foreign country. Imagine if you'd been told you'd be given a promised land, and you spent your whole time in it, dwelling in tents and moving from place to place, you think it's about time I took possession of this land. I've been given it, but no. He lived in tents, as did Isaac and Jacob, who were heirs of him, with him of the same promise. Now, why was he content to do that? Well, he had an amazing revelation. There are some people in, uh, in Old Testament prophets particularly, but Abraham, I think, was the first of them that I know about, who had a revelation of the new Jerusalem. He had a revelation of tw Revelation 21-22. Now, whenever I feel fed up, I read Revelation 21 and 22. I love the first two verses, chapters of Scripture and the last two, because in the first two, Satan hasn't made an appearance. In the last two, he's gone. He's got, he goes into the lake of fire in, in chapter 20. So I, I think they're wonderful chapters. And uh, 
It says, for Abraham, for he was looking forward to the city with foundations, whose builder and architect and maker is God. He was looking forward to the new Jerusalem. Even at the time when he was being given the promised land, God gave him a revelation of the end product, the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth. Somehow Abraham had some kind of revelation of them, and he looked forward to God's eternal purposes. And we're told about Abraham and Sarah and so on. And verse 13, all these people were still living by faith when they died. They didn't receive the things they promised. Didn't really worry them. They knew they were promised. They knew God would fulfill it. They only saw them and welcomed them from a distance. They knew that they were paving the way. Abraham knew that he was starting a work, not finishing it. And they admitted that they were aliens and strangers on earth. Now, Abraham, had come, of course, had come from the heart of civilization, Ur of the Chaldees. And it says, but people who say such things show they are looking for a country of their own. If they'd been thinking of the country they'd left, they'd had opportunity to return. Not a bit of it. Instead, they were longing for a better country, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. In, in these days, when all hell seems to be breaking loose, and I think I can assure you, without wanting to worry you, that even greater hell will break loose yet. We're only in the beginning stages of it. Um, God wants us to know that there is a city prepared for us. And it's one that Satan can't do a darn thing about. He can't take it away. He can't stop it. He, he can only try and take away our faith. Well, we have to hold on to that. And we hold on to that by knowing the word. And we live in days when there is, there's much shaking going on uh, in the world and in the church. And one major purpose of the shaking in God's purpose is to separate the true church from the world and its ways. Yes. To separate the church which is salt and light, which cannot be shaken, from the church which is absolute darkness. The church where the, where the archbishop wants to be inclusive. The church where an archbishop wants to dress little boys in girls' clothing so that they fit into their society. Where the word of God is in conflict with the culture of the society, there's only one thing that needs to change. And it isn't the word of God because he doesn't change his word for anybody. It's the culture that's got to change. And sooner or later, God will force it to change, whether it's nice or not. But there will be much upheaval. We're in the days of Psalm 2 rebellion. We're in, we're in the days where the nations rage and the peoples plot a vain thing. And it says in Psalm 2, uh, why? Because they're in total rebellion against the Lord and his anointed. The kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers gather together against the Lord and against his anointed one. This is Psalm 2 and verse 2. Let us break their chains, they say, and throw off their fetters. Well, most people in this country have virtually forgotten there are any chains or fetters from God. In fact, they are taught there's no God at all. Uh, it's not much different in America, although they all say, God bless America. I don't see how God can bless America, frankly, because of the things that they do. They take down the Ten Commandments from the courthouses. Um, but it's not as dramatic as it is here. And, uh, and then these, these chilling words actually come. The one enthroned in heaven laughs. I wouldn't want to hear that laughter, would you? I think it would chill me to the marrow, hearing God's laughter over this one. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. Jesus is already, as far as God's concerned, Jesus is already installed as king on Zion, God's holy hill. It doesn't matter what the it doesn't matter what Mahmoud Abbas or the United Nations or anybody else says. Um, God, God has said he's installed him. And that that's that's it. Now for so, for so long the visible church in the West has lived as though we belong to both kingdoms, the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of God's world. We don't. We live in the kingdom of this world because we are told God has put us here to live and function as salt and light in the darkness of this world. He's put us here so that we can vote. 
he's put us here as citizens of, of Great Britain. But it's, it's, not to, it's to establish his kingdom. It's not to establish the kingdom of this world. Remember how much Jesus liked the kingdoms of this world. I might talk to you about the wilderness in a minute. Um, that would take a long time. But when, when Jesus, if everybody who uh, is called to serve God finds themselves in one way or another in the experience which you can only call the wilderness. The wilderness is absolutely biblical. Moses spent 40 years in Midian. Jesus, when he was baptized, the Spirit drove him straightway into the wilderness. And some people think, oh, the wilderness, well, that's a place of peace. Well, you know, not, not a bit of it. Satan came right with him. Paul went into the wilderness, the desert of, of, uh, of Arabia, and where he received the gospel. Do you think for one moment that Satan didn't trouble him while he was getting it? Question him. Do you really believe? That's his best one, isn't it? Do you really? Did God really say, come on, Paul? Come on, you're losing your mind out in this desert. Well, he did the same to Jesus, I tell you. And when he came to him in the testings, Jesus had been in the wilderness for 40 days without food or water, with the cold and heat, and the Judean wilderness is no nice place to be at night or in the middle of the day either. Uh, and the wild animals were with him. And by the, by the end of 40 days, he was fully human. He must have thought from time to time, am I just going crazy? His head must have spun under the sun. He must have shivered with the cold and thought, did I, did I really get baptized? Did I, was it a hallucination? Did John really, did I see that dove? Did, did Father really speak? And then guess who turns up? Satan turns up. If you are the son of God, you're very hungry after 40 days, why not just turn these stones to bread? It is written. And he quotes Deuteronomy at him. But the one I, one I uh, focus on most is when he takes you up the high mountain and shows him all the kingdoms of this world. Now, you would have thought, perhaps, that Jesus had come to take back all the kingdoms of this world. But he didn't. Neither did he say, because Satan said, I have authority. If you will bow down and worship me, which is what he absolutely wanted, I have authority to give them to you. Now, as Satan is the prince of this world, he probably did have authority to give them to him. The thing is, Jesus didn't want them. It's the last thing he wanted. Jesus lived Daniel 2 where the great statue of Nebuchadnezzar, we can see it all in being now, the four great empires, the Babylonian, the Greek, the Medo-Persian, the, Medo the Greek, and the Roman are all invisible in one form or another in this present world system. And you remember the rock cut out without hands falls from the mountain, falls on the feet of the whole statue, and the whole statue crumbles to powder and blows away into the earth, but the stone grows and grows and fills the earth. The stone is the kingdom of God. Jesus is not interested in the kingdoms of this world. He knows perfectly well that the time comes when he return, and he will sweep them totally away and establish the kingdom of God. So Satan couldn't get him interested in that at all. Even if he had the authority, and he probably had, Jesus never said, Thou shalt worship only the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So Jesus knew his scripture. Beloved, we must know the scripture. When I came out of my office, the Lord had prevented me from going to a theological college. Now, he, uh, because it was an Anglican theological college, I don't know. But all sorts of things I would have been taught, which I would have had to unlearn. As it was, I had some very good teachers. One was a man called Dick Lucas, who was very much my mentor in the city of London. Dick taught me some wonderful things. He taught me also that it was cessationism. He taught me that uh, there was no such thing as the manifestations of Holy Spirit now, so we had to disagree a little bit about that. Michael Green finally came round. John Stott always stood firm and went off finally into annihilationism um, with a really good brother called Roger Forster. He went into annihilationism. 
and say, well, no, God's too merciful to put anybody away, they just get blotted out, which I'm afraid isn't in Scripture. It's a lovely idea, but not in Scripture. It's no good making God better than we are, as we think. God says, I'm sorry, but I'm better than you are, and you better accept it. But God put me in the wilderness. We didn't expect it. When I came out of the office, we, we, we had been expecting for some years that the calling of God would materialize, and indeed it did. And we thought the first thing that would happen uh, would be that God would have some, some wonderful calling, some, some great mission, some... Well, we spent seven years in the most howling wilderness you can possibly imagine, uh, with with the scriptures, with the Holy Spirit, with whatever God wanted to teach us, but mostly he taught us himself. And you imagine when you go off into the wilderness for seven years, most people don't really want to know you. The uh, I, I remember the, the Anglican vicar of the village we were in at the time came around to see us and said, I hear you've left your office. I said, yes, well, it's the Lord's calling. Well, we had a long talk about the manifestations of the Holy Spirit. That didn't get us off very well, but it was about an hour and a half of that, and finally we thought we'd better call that all. He said, well, I hear, you. I hear you've left your office to serve the Lord. And I said, that's what I believe I've been told to do. And he said, well, that's wonderful. Now, which college are you going to? <laughs> I said, well, so far the Lord hasn't said anything. Oh, well... Never mind. Is it India or Africa or is it the Far East? I said, well, he hasn't actually told me to go anywhere just yet. <laughs> oh. You mean you're staying here? <laughs> well, he hasn't told us to do anything else. Oh, that's very difficult. That's, that's very awkward. Well, it wasn't very long before... <laughs> About three people wanted to know us. And the rest, we became part of a charismatic house church. And I can identify exactly with some of the experience that my brother had with the JWs. Because our charismatic house church, after a while, the Lord started giving me words of prophecy. Which was very embarrassing because I was told not to prophesy. And when I was told not to prophesy, I thought, well, I'm a man under authority. I could come to the meetings, but I was not to open my mouth. So I said, all, all right. I was only, whatever I was, I was still, still about 30, perhaps. And I, I thought, well, okay, that will do. Um, and Lord, they told me not to. I, I, I won't. So I went to the meeting, and the first thing that happened, well, not quite the first thing, in the middle of the meeting, to my horror, the Lord started giving me a word of prophecy. Well, I, you know, when the word start, the Lord starts giving you something, you know it. You just know it. It's like Jeremiah, it burns within you. And, and I just thought, Lord, I can't give this. I've given my word. I'm not to give this out. Lord, it's not to happen. Well, the Lord took not the slightest notice. No notice whatever. He didn't listen to any of the pleadings, didn't listen to any of the arguments, didn't listen to any of the fact, Lord, I'm under authority. The Lord didn't actually say, well, actually, you're under my authority, but he might well have done. And I was under his authority. So he started to shake me. And I shook. And I shook. Not like the Toronto sort of shake. It's just as if every internal organ in my body was shaking. It felt as if my heart and my liver and my kidneys and everything else, everything that could go up and down was going up and down. And, and I thought, Lord, this is going to fly out the top of my head. Please stop, please stop, please stop. And the Holy Spirit was so gracious, he said, it'll stop when you open your mouth. <laughs> I thought, oh no, you've got me over a barrel, haven't you? So I opened my mouth and I gave the word. There was a stony silence. And I thought, well, shall I wait to the end of the meeting or wait no? Oh, they are going to ask me to go now. Well, it wasn't very long before the story started getting round. And all the brethren with whom I had sweet fellowship crossed the road for the next four years while we lived in that village. So it happens in the charismatic church as well as, as, well as in any other. It was becoming a cult. But it was during that time the Lord put me on one side and started speaking to me about the dangers of empire building, yes. which was what was going on very much at the time. 
It was the heavy discipling and shepherding. It was the empire building. And then he gave me a picture which is very re relevant, I believe, to today. And um, can you dear folks still hear me in there? Um, if you don't want to, you better shut the door. Uh, <laughs> and uh, you're, you're all right, are you? Okay. <laughs> Uh, it was in the it was in the days. Um, it's, it's very relevant, I think, to what we're talking about now, because the Lord started speaking to me about all sorts of things when I was just sitting on my own. I was waiting on Him. I was waiting on Him for many hours a day, and during that time, there's often a lot of silence. But sometimes the Lord will really speak, and suddenly you know He's going to speak. And I was reminded of a game. Well, it was, it was a sort of game. When I was a very little boy, I used to go to the Science Museum in South Kensington. And I was intrigued down the children's department by a whole lot of beads, black and white, which all rolled down together, uh, rolling down a gentle slope. And when you pressed the button, it was obviously, I didn't know it at the time, it was obviously an electromagnet came in. And these beads jumped so that they were separated. The black and the white suddenly separated into two streams, and suddenly I was reminded of this all these years on, and the Lord said, that is what it's going to be like in the professing church. He said, there is going to be a complete division, and I am going to do it. Yes. I'm, going to, I'm going to put it to, to, to my people. They are either have to, go in to walk with me, or they're going to have to walk in a different path, and he said at that time there will be a big separation and there will be far fewer who will walk with you, far fewer, if you like, of the white beads than those who will go on happily in their black stream. Yes. And at the same time, and the Lord said, you may find this very hard to believe, he said, but there will be far more who will not walk with you and you will be amazed at the people you think will walk with you who won't. Yes. And he then said, and those who won't will all turn against you. Mm. And I was hearing that in the 70s. Yes. And when, when Ian was talking last night, I thought, my goodness, it certainly is happening. God said it would happen, and it is happening, and it certainly will happen. But we can't. There has to be a distinction. There has to be a difference. We don't belong to both kingdoms. 1 John 2 is very clear, verse 15, Love not the world, nor the things of the world. James 4 and verse 4, He who loves the world makes himself an enemy of God. He starts off, he's talking to, talking to believers, says, you adulterous people. That's idolatry. Adultery and idolatry are the same thing. You adulterous people, do you not know that if you love the world, you make yourself an enemy of God? Well, when you read that, you think, well, I've got a choice, haven't I? It's pretty stark. I'm going to love the world, I'm going to make myself an enemy of God. And God, we can't make any kind of impact on the world if we are corporately in bed with the world system. It just isn't possible. We have to come out. If, if the church won't change, and it won't, because it's going absolutely the wrong way, then we, we must come out. There must be the remnant church. There is. There always has been, as a matter of fact. There's a lovely little book called The Pilgrim Church by a man called E.H. Broadbent, written in the 1930s. It's still in print, I believe, and is a wonderful book of how right from the very beginning there have had to be breakaway movements, which some would have called cults, but most of them weren't cults, they were, they were breakaway movements from the mainstream church, which was largely the, the Roman church, of course, at the time, uh, by groups of people who were seeking to preserve an essential element of the truth of the word of God. And they all had to break away. They were usually small in number, while the mainstream church went on its merry way. And you had the Albigenses, and you had the Valdenses. They had to go up into the mountains. They were all persecuted. You had the Anabaptists. They were all seeking to preserve an essential element of truth. You had the Scottish Covenanters. Uh, and, of, and of course, you had uh, biggest of all, you had the breach between Protestant and Catholic in the 16th century. 
praise God, he preserved us. And, and let me, I, I'm diverting all over the place. I, I, I always do. Anybody who, well, anyway, most people seem to know. Um, Lord, where, do you, where exactly do you want us to go? No, I, th I think we should. I think we should go on with. Uh, well, just for a change, we won't divert. We'll, we'll go on with, with what we're trying to do. There are certain things we need to know clearly about what's happened. Many of us will know this already. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter eight. Because God has a, has a big question here in Jeremiah chapter 8. And probably most of us will know what the answer is. But we really need to know it. We need to be alert. We've got to be on guard. These are days of deception. Do you remember how Jesus said to the disciples when they said, Lord, what will be the sign of your coming at the end of the age? The first thing he said was, see to it that no man deceive you. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and deceive many. Before he said anything else about earthquakes, famines, anything else, see to it that no man deceive you. Because deception will be the greatest, the greatest possible a uh, danger to the church in the last days. It will be it will be deception. Now Satan loves to work as the serpent. You remember Revelation twelve, he appears, he's the great serpent and dragon. He loves to be the serpent. Sneaky deception. Did God really say, Well, well, why not do I not do it? But if you don't if you fall, don't fall for it, all of a sudden the dragon appears. And there is persecution. And there will be very severe persecution. This, this nation is in for very severe judgment. Not just the church. God wants Brexit. There's no question about it. But don't be fooled into thinking that Brexit is immediately going to bring us sweetness and light. Brexit is already bringing us the utmost confusion, dissension, division. I believe that by the time Brexit has worked itself out, in whatever way God does work it out, we may very well see blood in the streets. Because God has, God, God has, yes, before we go to Jeremiah 8, let's just, just go back to that. Satan hates this nation more than almost any other nation on the face of the earth. Possibly he hates Israel more for very good reasons, because he always has. Possibly he may hate the United States more, but he hates Britain as much as any nation. There's no nation on the face of the earth he's wanted to destroy more than Britain. And we have stood in Satan's way for at least a thousand years. We've stood in Satan's way and prevented him from establishing what his purpose is, which is to establish a European-wide domination. He wants to rule the globe, his purpose to rule the globe, from a European base. And he started trying right back in the days of Charlemagne. And we had a king in England called Ophir, king of Mercia, who refused to go along with Satan, say, uh, with uh, well, Satan, yes, but with Charlemagne. Charlemagne wanted um, a, a marriage contract between his son and Ophir's daughter by which he would establish a hold over Mercia, which was a major part of England. And Ophir saw through it. He realized he'd just become a vassal of Charlemagne, and I'm not having any of this. We're British, we're independent. We're not, we're not having this, this guy ruling us through this marriage. So he didn't do it. And ever since then, we have stood in Satan's way over and over again. We fought the Hundred Years' War. We, we prevented a domination from, from the continent. 
we fought uh, the Spanish Armada. God preserved Protestantism in this country. Just despite Mary, he, he preserved Protestantism. We fought the Armada. We saw off it was the end of the Spanish Empire. So Spain never got the rule over us, even though they had the rule over the Netherlands and, and an empire elsewhere. We fought the Marlborough Wars. We fought the Napoleonic Wars. We fought the wars against Hitler. And in both the Napoleonic Wars and the wars against Hitler, um, this little group of islands was absolutely strategic. We stood against Satan and we were standing plumb in the way. We blocked the dictator he was raising up. Napoleon wanted to, was a form of antichrist. Uh, um, Hitler, of course, was a form of antichrist. And when a dictator seeks to, see, starts to establish an empire, he has to go on expanding. He can't just stop. He has to break out. Now, I, he wanted to break out west. He wanted to break out and take England. He wanted to move on to America couldn't do it. We had the sea power to stop him. We had the miracle of God in the Battle of Britain. He couldn't get the air cover to, to make his invasion. So eventually he had to do what Napoleon had had to do. Because we'd blocked off the, uh, so we blocked off the Suez Canal, we held the Straits of Gibraltar, he couldn't break out in that direction. There's only one way for either of them to break out, um, because under Nelson we held the Mediterranean, under the, the, the Navy we held the uh, Mediterranean in the time of Hitler, we'd retaken North Africa under Montgomery, we prevented the Germans from going into Israel, which they wanted to do, um, we'd broken the power of the Turkish Empire in the First War. There was only one way to go, and that was into Russia. And that was the fatal mistake for both Napoleon and, and Hitler. They went into Russia and perished in the snows of Russia. It was a terrible mistake and it was their undoing. And we prevailed and prevailed and prevailed for a thousand years. And each time Satan was prevented from establishing his European domination. Now he's tried to do it a different way. He's tried to destroy us from within with left-wing liberalism and all the, all the junk we've got in the church, in the education, both theological and secular education. Uh, my friend Clifford, when he was a lecturer at the LSE in the late 1950s, said he believed he was probably the only non-card-carrying communist who was, on, who was a lecturer there. You know, he was a sociologist as well as a theologian. And finally, through the treachery of uh, Edward Heath yes. and the lies, the lies the man told. Well, I mean, they all tell lies, don't they? Um, we've got another one telling lies right now. They all told lies, and Edward Heath told more lies than any of them. Edward Heath got us into the common market. John Major signed the Maastricht Treaty. Tony Blair signed the Lisbon Treaty. And there we were, but there was one escape clause in the Lisbon Treaty in its Article 50. And we're battling to get out. And we need somebody, unless God intervenes, we need somebody stronger than the present government to get us out. I don't know who we need. God knows who we need. Some of us may think we know who we need. The most upright man of integrity that I know of is Jacob Rees-Mogg. But he's not yet, at any rate, in position to do it. But Boris Johnson knows what is right. He is a remarkable, God may use him. Please, God, use somebody else. But there's going to be trouble, whichever way it is. We're going to have trouble. And this, this Brexit, which God wants, and which is going to set us free from the domination of Europe, will also bring us into a time of judgment. Because, for heaven's sake, we've... We've legalized witchcraft. We've legalized abortion. We've legalized homosexuality of just about every sort. We've legalized things that were thought impossible. We've legalized same-sex marriage. We're into this transgender business. We're, we're just doing everything possible to deny the God of creation. And if you read Romans 1, you'll find the God of creation refuses to be denied. Yes. Ultimate, we're in stage three of his judgment on us now, and it will happen.
God will deal with it. He's very patient and long-suffering, but he will deal with it. Okay, so the, the shaking is intended as a judgment on those who serve the, have ignored all, all the warnings he's given. I could spell out some of the warnings, but there really isn't time. God is seeking to separate out a true, genuine ecclesia. Do you know, one of the most long-lasting, apparently harmless things was when the King James Version of the Scriptures was, was translated. There was the word ecclesia in it many times. And every time the translators translated it as being church, because James I had strong Catholic leanings, his son had even more strong, they had changed as church, which, which meant it came across as being the institution. But God doesn't mean that by ecclesia. Ecclesia is the assembly of called out people. We are the ecclesia. Every gathering of called out people is part of the ecclesia. It doesn't matter about any stone building or archbishop with, the court with Dagon on his head or anything like that. Uh, I mean, he's got all this clobber. Even the bishop's crozier is actually a Babylonian symbol. Practically every piece of, of clothing that a bishop wears is pagan. And, you know, this is, this is, this is, what, this is what we put up with for years. But... We've, we're left with the legacy that we think of Ecclesia as being church. It is not church in God's thinking. It's us. It's not the building down the road. It's, it's not the Vatican. It's not, it's not St. Paul's. They're wonderful buildings. God's used them for various purposes. But we are the Ecclesia. And God wants a separate a true Ecclesia, those who are called out from the world to be in it as salt and light, but not to be of it. Brethren, we are the people, as Ian said last night, we are the people who are to dig out the wells and keep them clear. We are the people who are to bring living water, because there isn't any other living water except that which comes from the Spirit of God. It's the Word and the Spirit together. Isaiah 43 says to Israel, You are my witnesses. Acts chapter 1, Jesus says again to the disciples, You are my witnesses. A people who know their God and display to the world His character and His ways. Now God, let, let me read this. Uh, how much time have I got, John? Do we know? Twenty minutes. Twenty. 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 All day. Oh, thank. <laughs> right. You have to put the lights on then. Yep. God wants. Well, I'm going. To, I'm going to leave Jeremiah eight for the moment, because I, I want to talk about something slightly different. Um. As a matter of fact, I want to talk about all sorts of different things. Now, the number of things I want to talk about once I get going. <laughs> anyway, God has a big complaint. It, it is a big complaint. And it is in Psalm 95. And it is repeated in Hebrews chapter 3. Psalm 95. Uh, for, 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 the, for the sake of time, because I probably... Probably shan't be allowed to stay here all day. Um, Psalm 95. Verse 10. He's talking about his people in the wilderness in this particular case. <coughs> Verse 10 of Psalm 95. It says, for 40 years. Oh, no, let's, start, let's start a verse back. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did at Meribah, as you did there that day at Massa in the desert. Do you remember they were always kicking up against God in the desert? Oh, I'm sorry to say that one does kick up against God in the desert. There was a time when I was in the wilderness complaining about it. Well, I was really worried. I thought I was going the wrong way. And I was complaining about it. And finally, I suddenly heard God say very clearly in my spirit, shut up. And sit and sit down. And I thought, oh, uh, <laughs> I shut up and sat down. And he said, "Stop complaining about the wilderness." 
As I was, I was saying, Lord, nothing grows. There's no fruit. There's no results. Nothing good has happened. And God said, nothing does grow in the wilderness. You can plant anything you like and it won't grow in the wilderness. Until I send some water on it, it won't grow. So don't worry about it not growing in the wilderness. And then he said, by the way, I don't care what you plant in the wilderness or what you don't plant in the wilderness. I don't care what you do in the wilderness. It's what the wilderness does in you that I can care about. All of a sudden, it had been turned on its head and I had a different idea. Right. So here they were in the wilderness, grumbling away, where your fathers tested and tried me, though they'd seen what I did. For 40 years I was angry with that generation. I said, they are a people whose hearts go astray, and they have not known my ways. Please take note of that, they have not known my ways. We need to know his ways. How do we know his ways? God has his own ways. It's repeated in Hebrews chapter 3, almost word for word. He said, they should not enter my rest because they have not known my ways. Now, God's ways are revealed in his word. I, I, I would like to go on all afternoon uh, with this because it's such a big subject. But I want to take one example, if I may, um, of, of uh, God's, God's particular ways. And it has to do with the Ark of the Covenant. Now, in 1 Samuel... Chapter 10, remember God didn't want them to have a king, but they insisted on having a king. He really wanted it to be a genuine theocracy. Yes. But he said, all right, and he said, Samuel, they're not rejecting you, they're rejecting me. They want to go the way of the world and have a king. Okay, give them a king, but give them a king and tell them what it would be like. You'd think you'd give them a good king to start with. King David straight off, not a bit of it. So I'll give you this king, and he will take. And he will take. And he will take your fields. And he will take your lands. And he will take your sons. And he will take your daughters. And in that day you will cry out to me because of the king, but I shall not listen. Anyway, he did warn them. And he gave them a king, and he gave them King Saul. And King Saul... In uh, 1 Samuel 10, now Saul had been anointed by Samuel at the beginning of the chapter uh, as leader over his inheritance. He'd been anointed as king and he'd been told certain things to do and he'd been told that the Holy Spirit would come upon him. Now in the Old Testament, you find the Holy Spirit coming upon people for the work of ministry, kings and prophets as a rule, and he came upon the Holy Spirit came upon Saul. It didn't say he indwelt him. There wasn't any indwelling until Jesus breathed on the disciples and said, Receive Holy Spirit. That, I believe, was actually the birthday of the church. When he simply said, Believe Holy, re Receive Holy Spirit. But here, the Holy Spirit came upon Samuel to anoint him for the work of service. And then Samuel told him what to do. And he told him in verse 5 to go to Gibeah of God, where there's a Philistine outpost. He said, the Spirit of the Lord, verse 6, will come upon you in power. You will prophesy with them. You will be changed into a different person. Once these signs are fulfilled, do whatever your hand finds to do, for God is with you. Go down ahead of me to Gilgal. That's the first real command. That's the first instruction that God gave Saul as the newly anointed king. Now Samuel is the boss, Samuel is the representative of God. So he says, I will surely come down to you to offer sacrifice, burnt offerings and fellowship offerings, but you must wait seven days until I come to you and tell you what you are to do. As Saul turned to leave Samuel, 
God changed Saul's heart, and all these signs were fulfilled that day. And you find later that he was a, a head and shoulders above all the other people of Israel. And I heard a, a, a teacher I loved listening to years ago called Ern Baxter. And I remember Ern Baxter saying that he was head and shoulders above all Israel. He said the head stands for human wisdom, the shoulders stand for human strength. He said neither of the slightest use, not when you're dealing with God. But that's what he used. He, was, he used his natural attributes, and they weren't any use to him. When Goliath turned up, they were no use at all. So he was a head taller, and so he was anointed king, and God had already warned them that he would not be the sort of king they wanted. Incidentally, this matter of king is, is, is very important, isn't it? It was when the Israelites, when the Jews, said, we will have no king but Caesar, it sealed their fate. They specifically rejected the law. You can't reject the law of God straight out like that. We, we have no king but Caesar, which was direct disobedience, and it was Caesar who turned up in AD 70. It was Caesar who came, who came and destroyed the temple and the city. But they'd chosen to have no king but Caesar. I don't believe it was anything to do with uh, uh, having set him up before the Romans. I think that was what actually brought it down on them. It was when they rejected the word of God that God said, right, that's it. Now, in, verse, in chapter 11, you find that Saul was in Gibeah. Let us his work is in, uh, break in um, no very pardon let's go to set chapter 13 I'm trying to save time here because I need to verse 2 you remember Samuel said go down before me to Gilgal and wait seven days and I will come to you and tell you what you are to do so we find him at Gilgal Verse 2 of Samuel 13, Saul chose 3,000 men from Israel, 2,000 were with him from Michmash in the hill country of Bethel, and 1,000 were with Jonathan at Gibeah of Benjamin. The rest of the men he sent back to their homes. Jonathan, Saul's son, attacked the Philistine outpost at Gibeah, and the Philistines heard about it. Then Saul had the trumpets blown throughout the land and said the balloon's gone up. I let the Hebrews hear. It's, it's happened. Jonathan's really set the cat among the pigeons. So all Israel heard the news. Saul has attacked the Philistine outpost, and now Israel has become an offense to the Philistines, which must have worried some of them. And the people were summoned to join Saul at Gilgal. Now, that was exactly where he was supposed to be. Philistines assembled to fight Israel, 3,000 uh, chariots, 6,000 charioteers, soldiers as numerous as the sand on the seashore. When the men of Israel saw their situation was critical and their army was hard-pressed, they hid. Told you it was a bad situation. They hid in caves and thickets, rocks, pits, and cisterns. Some Hebrews even crossed the Jordan, the land of Gad and Gilead. So his army was scattering in fear. Saul remained at Gilgal, right, he was still in the right place. All the troops with him were quaking with fear. He waited seven, seven days. It means he waited until the seventh, he was on the seventh day. The time set by Samuel, but Samuel did not come to Gilgal. He was in the seventh day and Samuel hadn't turned up. So what happened? Saul's men began to scatter. They said, oh, he's not coming, he's not coming, he's not coming. So what did Saul say? He said, bring me the burnt offering and the fellowship offerings. Saul was a Benjaminite. Yes. He had no authority to offer any offerings of any sort. It was a Levitical matter. It was for Samuel to do it. Yes. He disobeyed the law by offering up as a Benjaminite. So he had pressed the panic button. There have been many times when I've been, particularly in the wilderness, and I could tell you something, maybe I'll tell you a bit more tomorrow, I don't know, I've got, um, we'll see where we go tomorrow. 
But uh, many times I could have pressed the panic button and usually a dear brother called Roger Price arrived at the right sort of time, just in time to prevent me from pressing the panic button and said, doesn't matter what it looks like, God's put you here, go on. And we went on. He saved me many times that way. He always brought an encouragement which I couldn't dispute. But Saul pressed the panic button. Now the flesh doesn't press the panic button. You can walk in the flesh or you can walk in the spirit. The difference between the flesh and the spirit is whose will is getting done around here. If it's your will, you're in the flesh. If it's God's will, you're in the spirit. It's a simple distinction, but it's not very easy to think it out at the time. We act in panic in the flesh. We've got to learn not to act in panic in the flesh. God doesn't have panic buttons. There are no panic buttons in God's kingdom, but Saul pressed the panic button in the flesh. And it says, bring me the burnt offering, the fellowship offerings. And Saul offered up the burnt offering. Just as he finished making the offering, Samuel arrived. Yes. How often have you just done it? Yes. And then suddenly you become aware that God's turned up and said, what are you doing? What's going on around here? Yes. Yes. What? You, you didn't know I was looking on? I hadn't said anything. I was here. Why have you done that? And say, oh Lord, <laughs> I've done it again. <laughs> anyway, Samuel suddenly arrived at the psychological moment. That was bound to happen because God does that. And Saul went out to greet him. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw the men were scattering and you hadn't come at the set time and the Philistines were assembling at Michmash, I thought, that was where he went wrong. He should have started praying. He didn't. He started thinking. He started thinking it out. I thought, I better I'm offering the fern offering. Now the Philistines will come down against me at Gilgal. I have not sought the Lord's favor. So I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. Samuel wasn't having any of it. You know, oh, poor old Saul, I understand how you felt. Nothing like it. You acted foolishly, Samuel said. You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him, <coughs> who's going to be King David, and appointed him leader of his people because you've not kept the Lord's command. And I haven't really got time to take longer. I would like to, perhaps I will complete this tomorrow, but you will find that when it goes on later in the scriptures, you find that the Ark of the Covenant is being captured by the Philistines when Eli was high priest. And when, it came, when Saul died, and it came as a long war between Saul and David, and David finally prevailed, Saul got killed, and Jonathan got killed. And David decided, we ought to bring the Ark of the Covenant back from the Philistines, because the Philistines had had nothing but trouble. They got boils and hemorrhoids and piles and all sorts of excitement they had as a result. And they took it from one Philistine city to another, and uh, they all got trouble. And they decided to send it back into Israel. And they put it on a new ox cart. And the oxen went straight up the road and over the border into Israel. David decided he must bring it back. He must get it back where it should be. And he put it on a nice new ox cart. And a man called Azar died. Because it says of his irreverence. Because the oxen stumbled. And he put out his hand. Now, the only people allowed to touch the Ark of the Covenant were members of the Kohathite division of the house of Levi. And he wasn't. But he did the natural thing. The oxen stumbled, so the cart rocked, and it looked as if the Ark would fall off. Oh, gosh, I must stop the Ark falling off. So he put out his hand to stop it. He should he'd have done better to let it go. And God slew him on the spot because of his irreverence. And David learned. He went, he was very angry, he was very upset. 
he went back and he started learning what the law really said about it. And finally, he said it was because we did not bring it up in the proper way. Yes. We've got to do God's things in God's ways. Right. If we don't know, we do better to stop and pray and wait until we do know. Because God is not pleased when we do things in the ways of the world. And David did the things of the ways of the world. Uh, I think we'll have to stop there because no doubt lunch is beckoning and many of your tummies are keen on lunch. We will stop there and God willing we will go on tomorrow. I don't know what we'll go on with but we'll carry on tomorrow. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much.